hi everybody. Thank you uh, so much to Dan and the design driven folks for having us. Um, I have to admit, so when Dan and I were first talking um, a couple months ago about Yusuf and I coming to talk here, and he said, why don't you talk about designing your employer brand, I had a little bit of a heart attack. Because I think that um, when people talk about recruiting, you generally have one of two reactions. Sometimes it's, oh my god, yes, I need people, my company's growing, we can't find enough talented folks, especially designers and developers. And sometimes it's a bunch of HR words, um, including the word employer brand, which I think tends to make people zone out a bit. So we wanted to keep this pretty fun, pretty quick, try and get uh, you guys to the pizza really soon. We wanted to talk, though, about this idea of being real. So how do you stop worrying about being the bomb, being perfect, creating this perfect magical company image, um, and be yourself, and use that to attract really great people to your company, based on some of our lessons building the muse. So very quickly, I want to start with why does it matter? A lot of people, um, I think when they think about this idea of designing the brand that your company puts out there to the world, there's this question of, of, of why should I bother? You know, there's a million things to do, there's a million tests to run, why does it matter what candidates are thinking about me? These are just three of the questions that I think are important to consider uh, when you're thinking about investing this time, which is right now, if you uh, pretend that you don't work at the company you're at now, if you put yourself in the shoes of a candidate who's out there um, thinking about their next move, or actually even better, someone who has a great job, they like where they work, they might be open to moving around, but nothing but a really exciting opportunity is going to catch their attention. Um, what is it that they're thinking about your company? What are the attributes they're associating with you, the ideas of what it might be like to work for you, um, and are the right people even thinking about applying to your jobs. Um, if you do this well, it's a fantastic thing because it means that really, really talented people are actually coming to you and they're coming for the right reasons. So what does that mean? I think a lot of startups make one of two mistakes underselling or overselling when it comes to recruiting. So underselling is here. This is a pretty obvious one. Um, this is a senior backend engineer job. I don't want to sort of make fun of the specific company, but frankly, it's really hard to recruit designers and engineers if all you do is give them a list of the requirements that they have to have to be considered for a job at your company. In fact, this company could be a great place to work uh, on, the, on the left here, but you'd never know because there's nothing in that job description that really tells you why you might actually want to work there. The flip side is a lot of people see that and they say, okay, great, I've got to attract talent, and they flip to the opposite extreme, which is overselling, which is come join one of the most amazing kick-ass companies in the entire world, ours. Uh, that might be true for one person or two people in this room, but generally most companies are a mixed bag. There are certain things about them that are amazing and that are going to really attract certain people, and there are other things that might not be a good fit for certain people, um, kind of like a metaphor that I really like to use for this, which is dating. So let's think about this. Uh, you pull out your app one night. You're feeling like you're really excited to go on a date. Um, oh my god, how exciting. You just matched with George Clooney. This is like the best thing ever. He seems like he checks every single box. And then Jonah Hill shows up on your date. Um, Jonah Hill is not, by the way, an objectively bad choice. He actually has a lot to his name. He's a successful comedian, um, done some great screenwriting, but he isn't George Clooney. Similarly, if you as a company put an image forward on your careers page of yourself as the George Clooney of places to work, um, somebody who is otherwise really excited might be a little disappointed when they get to know the warts uh, because of the expectations you set. So I will pass it over to Yusuf um, by just wrapping up saying the exact same thing I think that we all know to be very true in dating. Catfishing obviously has become the subject of a celebrated TV show and not something that most of us do for a reason is equally true when you're recruiting. And so when you think about why then uh, to put forward this more honest picture of what it's like to work at your company, the next question then is how? Yeah, so we're gonna give a couple pointers on uh, ways that you can uh, improve the process. What button do I click here? That one. That one. Back. Probably the play button. That makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so, first of all, design a valuable and engaging candidate experience. So, uh, you know, everyone here has plenty of UX design uh, engineering expertise uh, to build really great products, but for some reason that same thoughtfulness isn't typically applied to uh, the candidate experience. Uh, so let's uh, look at a couple of examples. So, first of all, Vice. Uh, anyone want to guess? Is it a, uh, a good uh, employer experience or, or branding experience or not? Yeah, first example, it's not going to be. And I don't, I don't mean to pick on Vice. I mean, this is kind of typical, but here's the landing page to the careers site. So a wall of text. And you click around, and it's just it doesn't really improve. Um, here's a job listing, for example. Oh, man, this is the thing that drove me the most crazy. 
there's an ampersand escaped incorrectly. So like, just like lots of little details that are wrong. Um, the job descriptions will stay, say stuff like trendy office that don't really mean anything unless you really describe it or show what that means. Um, here's Spotify instead. Uh, this is actually a, a, a much better example because, um, you know, I, I, as soon as you go on the site, you're hit by rich media, beautiful images, video, you're not, you don't have a wall of text to work with. Um, my favorite touch is that the employees, they, they have profiles of the employees and the playlists that they, they have. And this is awesome because, you know, your typical person applying to a job at Spotify has probably used Spotify quite a bit. So why not add that, that personal touch? Um, and it just makes the whole experience feel way more authentic than what you might otherwise get, way less uh, impersonal. Uh, just more beautiful videos and images. Um, it just really, you know, it's, it's putting the same sort of UX and design thoughtfulness that you might expect out of a, a product like Spotify. Uh, tip two, speak like a human. This means a lot of things. Uh, that's Neil deGrasse Tyson, so <laughs> that's part of it, I guess. Um, so we'll, we'll focus on one thing, and that's uh, perks versus core values. And the big thing there is, you know, most job descriptions will focus on perks like Taco Tuesday, free snacks, stuff like that. Um, and that's really valuable. Like, people love that sort of stuff, but that does not convey the culture of your company. One of the things that does do this effectively are what are your really core values? And um, for engineering, specifically within the Muse, for example, when I'm pitching it to, to candidates, what I focus on is uh, the autonomy that we give uh, employees and the openness of our culture. And, you know, I, I, and to make sure that's not buzzwordy, uh, we bring up a, a few concrete examples. So open sprint policy, which gives discretion towards people to, to work on what interests them. Uh, heavy focus on open source software, both using and contributing to. Engineers love that stuff. Career ladders, you know, not the sexiest thing on the planet, but um, it adds transparency towards how do you uh, work your way up within the organization, and that really stresses uh, that management takes uh, people's personal growth uh, uh, very seriously and, and does it transparently. So when you think about bringing it all together, we looked at some of the lessons that we learned. We have about 700 companies that work with the Muse and 50 million people every year who use us to find a new job, uh, navigate their career. And we realized that when you sort sort of all of those people together, they obviously have very different preferences, different personalities. They're looking for different things, but you can group the things that draw them to companies really into one of three buckets in almost all cases. And to make it really easy to remember, we call them the three Ps, people, purpose, and path. People is, who will I be working with if I join your company? Uh, what are they like? What will my boss be like? What will my colleagues be like? Purpose is the desire to do work that has some sort of meaning. It doesn't have to be social impact, but it can be, by joining this company, what do I affect? Uh, what problems will I work on? What's the larger mission of being here? And then finally, path, opportunities for growth. What skills will I learn? Um, what might be ahead of me in my career? And what sort of opportunities could I get excited about? And we found that companies that find some elements of these three and put those front and center, rather than either the sort of uh, nothing candidate experience, where you learn very little about a company, or the rah, 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 we're perfect, we've got everything, Taco Tuesday's candidate experience, tend to be much, much more successful. So to close this out, um, we put together a, a sort of quick funnel that I think is a really interesting way to think about attracting people who do not necessarily know that uh, they want to work at your company right now. It starts at the top with making sure people know your company exists, giving them enough to get interested, ensuring your application process isn't terrible, and recruiting through the close. So creating awareness. There are lots of amazing people out there who do not even know that your company is hiring, or who know about it, but have never seriously thought about working there. I think that one of the both awesome and really challenging things about the startup space is that there's a lot of mythology around build it and they will come. If you have a great product, you launch it on Hacker News or TechCrunch and suddenly you have a massive audience. You have a great company, you stick your job descriptions up on your own careers page, 
and the best and brightest people in the world obviously are lining up outside your door to work at your company. But unfortunately, that's not always the way that it works. So we think a lot about how do you create awareness. One great example, hosting meetups in your offices. Great job, BuzzFeed. Having executives or people at your company out there at networking events, um, speaking at events, pu publishing blog posts. We've actually started to do a lot as we've gotten bigger of thinking about how do we make sure that if we do something different or we have a specific point of view on something that would be relevant to potential employees, that we're getting it out there and creating that awareness. Um, this is an example of a piece of content that might do that that helps you kind of see behind the scenes. People are also extremely voyeuristic. If you hit somebody with a job description, they're asking themselves, am I looking for a new job or not? Is this relevant? And in most cases, it's not going to be of interest to them. But if you hit them with a story with uh, a chance to learn more about a person or an aspect of your organization, a surprisingly large number of people, even those that don't think that they're job searching, will say, yeah, I'm kind of curious. Like, Let me know a little bit more. Once you've created awareness, you want to design an enjoyable journey. This is everything that Yusuf just talked through, um, putting yourself in a candidate's shoes and thinking, how do we make it fewer forms, fewer spaces? Um, how can we reduce the number of text and making it really human? Your application tracking process. Um, this is uh, something that I think is really interesting. When you think about why Uber has been so successful, there's a million reasons we could talk about, but one of them is that the fundamental experience of getting a taxi is not that great. And by removing friction and creating something that was that much more enjoyable, they were able to create a massive competitive advantage. Similarly, Seamless has won a great campaign, you've probably seen them in subways, about how annoying it is to call restaurants and order delivery. They can't hear you, there's always, the call drops halfway through, there's something happening on the end of the line. Seamless has capitalized really successfully on that. When you think about all of the different friction points that applying to the job, I think the industry standard is about 13% of people who start applying to a job actually finish it. We even see a couple companies on the Muse that will say, you know, we're not seeing the caliber of hires that we want, and we'll look at the data, and it turns out that 96% of people who said, yeah, I'm interested in applying to that engineering job, then bail out during their 40-minute process, somewhere around the point where they ask them for their social security number and a hand-typed list of every single place they've ever lived since they were 12. Um, so think about the application that you're asking candidates to go through. Again, the more qualified and sought after an individual, the less likely they are to jump through hoops to work at your company, no matter how fantastic it is. Um, and finally, recruit through the close. People, I, I find it always so fascinating when people say, great, this candidate signed, I'm so excited for them to join, and then it's radio silence for the two weeks until they start. It is not over until that person is in your office, showing up with their computer, really excited to work. So. Make sure your people know your company exists. Give them enough meat, enough data, enough culture, enough information to get them really interested. Uh, ensure your application process isn't terrible and recruit through the close. Thank you guys so much, and I guess we'll do Q&A. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so actually, I have a question about the previous slide. Um, so as a CEO, uh, what is one thing that your design team does um, that's a great question. So uh, I'll go backwards. I mean, so right now the thing I'm thinking of is one and the same. Um, I love when I can see the data and enough of the customer feedback beyond why we're doing something. So for example, um, we are actually considering whether to make some big changes to our company profiles. And for me, being involved you know, very early on to see exactly why, uh, what clients are saying, and in a way that I know, you know, is this a Fortune 1000 customer of ours versus a 15-person startup also impacts how I view that feedback. Um, I think one of the flip sides, I mean, we have a, we have a much larger design and engineering team, but we have a product team, or sorry, a design team of one, a product and engineering team of many, many multiples of that. But um, I mean, generally, he's pretty great. I would say there was once I didn't know about something we were building until it had been through so many iterations that it was hard to change, and that's always tough because there are sometimes things that I want to make sure are input in the process. But yeah, overall, so far, so good. You moved. <laughs> Uh, 
every company, had, regardless of their stage, you know, I remember when we were in our early days and we had no money and like we even struggled to get hardware, like basic things like that. Even then, we had really big points that we could brag about. Um, namely, when I think back about that, it was like the ratio of users to engineers was crazy off the charts. And, and so finding whatever it is that uh, sticks out about your company, uh, regardless of the stage you're in, is, is an important aspect to that. Um, engineer specifically, I, I think most of what engineers or designers want is probably most of what people in general want, like creativity or, or open space for creativity and, and you know, the ability to work on something without uh, being bossed around and, and told how to do it. Yeah, I'll also add in general that um, if you ideally have people who are either, obviously you said they're not, you, you don't have someone in the role because it's a new role, but people that are working at your company in roles that are maybe the closest to what you're hiring for, and just ask them, why did you choose this company? Why did you choose just this job? And what makes you stay? Because I can guarantee that almost anybody in this room um, is getting inbound from recruiters on a fairly frequent basis. Assuming that you're you know, on the internet, if you have a LinkedIn presence, why is it that people stay? And it's amazing the stories people tell you, and I find that that sometimes the stuff that you didn't necessarily think about, but that makes the best um, and most authentic way to recruit somebody else. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks for the presentation. You enjoyed it. Uh, yes. Uh, oh, hey. <laughs> so I noticed you had um, the, the graph of like, the steps you take to make a really good hire. What sort of things do you guys specifically look for, especially in terms of like, like the person who has like, the mindset? So uh, I'll start. I think um, before we post a job ever, we write out if we hire the most ex the person that we're incredibly excited about, what would they look like? And usually what you get is a couple of skills or competencies they'd be good at, and then a couple of core values. We have the same six uh, for every single person who works at the Muse. And actually, every, we don't actually talk about them publicly because they're such a sort of core part of our recruiting process. But every single person who interviews is vetted on all six, sometimes more than once. Um, and then there's, there's questions that we'll think about ahead of time for how you um, get at that. So for example, if you're looking for someone who's really going to take ownership, um, who's going to be willing to kind of uh, not, you know, shove the blame off if there's a mistake. You might ask, you know, tell me about a time when you were working on something where it didn't work out. What happened? And how did you recover? And it is really interesting. People will tell you, oh, I was working on this thing, but it wasn't my fault. It was that person's fault. And it was that person's fault. And you're like, it's really interesting. The example they chose, nothing was their fault versus someone who is much more um, telling you, and, and then obviously sometimes people will tell you the other, where they're like, I was doing something and I made this like catastrophically terrible mistake where you wonder if by you know, admitting it, that's maybe an error in judgment as well. But I think, um, yeah, when you figure out what it is that you're looking for, then it's not perfect. I mean, interviewing is such an imperfect art and you get it wrong, unfortunately, sometimes. But I think there are ways that you can be more effective, and part of that is figuring out what you're looking for before you go look for it. Otherwise, it's really easy to be like, oh, that person was great. They didn't really tell me anything, and I have no idea if they're good at any of these competencies, but you know, they, they seemed really funny and awesome. Anything else? Yeah, I, I don't know if I could put it better. Um, I do remember in our early days, we tried to recruit people based off of, you know, did they hit the metrics that like Google or Facebook would have, at least for, for engineers, and that was not a good idea. <laughs> um, a company at, at our size has much different needs, and, and once we started defining those things ahead of time, that, that helped a lot. Hey guys, I have a, a shout out and a two part question. So the shout out is uh, the news just did uh, uh, our company recruiting website, it was amazing, the experience was awesome, and I just wanted to say thank you. That's a, what company? So cool. Uh, teachers pay teachers. I saw it, that's awesome. That's awesome. We've been, it's been fun to send around, and it really does tell a lot of stories. Uh, and my question is two parts. So, if you were to start the company over again, um, what what type of designer would you want to hire, and what would you tell that designer that they have to do to scale this team in the right way? That's a great question. Um, so, 
I'll answer quickly, and then Yusuf has been here since we were, you were five, number five, basically. So you may have a thought too. So um, trying to choose my word carefully. We did actually have a designer early on, and I think one of the big learnings for me was, um, you know, it doesn't matter how beautiful your thing is if your users can't figure out how to use it. The first version of the Muse Company profile had places you could click to get more inside the office, to meet the employees, but nobody clicked on it because it was so clean and crisp and well you know, laid out that um, people didn't realize you could actually go there. And so I think that you know, there's a lot of, I would say most of the mistakes that we made in the early days were mistakes I made that had nothing to do with design, but as far as um, how I would think about that again, I'd put a even higher premium on usability so that people could understand very quickly what we wanted to do. I think I'd be a little bit uh, less precious with some of the early designs because when you, when you build something that you spend a lot of time making it perfect, it can be harder to change it than if you accept that it's a uh, you know, back of the envelope work in progress and keep iterating. Um, what was the second question I've already? <laughs> How would I recommend they scale the team? Um, I think one of the things that we got right the second time around and that has been really strong for our team was looking for people that had the empathy for the person using the product and empowering them to solve problems in really creative ways, to Yusuf's point. Uh, one of the things that I think is really neat about what we do at The Muse is almost every single person has gone through some sort of job search. A lot of times it's been a terrible experience at at least one point in time. Um, and obviously we don't just do job search, it's career more broadly, but I think the things that have been most successful have been finding individuals who really have a heart for the problem we're solving and are really excited, not just because it's an interesting problem, which it is, but because they love the idea of making people's lives a little less stressful, a little less anxious every single day by the work that they do. Yeah, uh, that, our designer is amazing right now. He's kind of an army of one <laughs> um, for a lot of those reasons. Uh, oh, and another thing I'd add is he's very uh, thorough. So the last presentation, uh, the, you know, we were talking about Envision and things like that. And, and our designer similarly will, will take the, the design pretty far. Um, it's not just balsamic wireframes <laughs> or anything like that. Uh, and that, that helps a lot. Um, I think the only thing I'd change is hire someone like that earlier. <laughs> we brought him on. We brought him on too late. <laughs> All right, uh, this question, are you hiring now? Yes. Uh, we actually are hiring a second designer. Uh, we are hiring for engineering, engineering front, product. back, full stock yeah. product, uh, specifically someone with a data and analytics focus, as well as all sorts of non-design and engineering roles. But um, yeah, I think we're pretty fun. Well, thanks to both of you very much. That was awesome. So thank you guys.